So when I see people telling me that I need to wear this and do this, I just think, you know what, it's okay. They just focused on the wrong thing. Like I was actually just writing in my notebook, like you can't be mad at people for what they weren't taught. If they weren't taught to work hard, if they weren't taught to chase their goals and be successful, but they're chasing everybody else's goals and chasing everybody else's success, then hopefully one day they find their way. But sometimes with most people, all you could do for them is hope for the best. Hey family, it's King Now, and you're doing Life for Lakeisha on Living Her Truth. Welcome to the Living Her Truth podcast, where we have honest conversations about what it means to live a purpose-driven life. I am your host, Lakeisha Wooder from LakeishaWooder.com, the place where women receive the tools necessary to feel seen, heard, and supported while pursuing their purpose. And now every week, you'll learn those same tools through candid and transparent conversations. Hey family, welcome to another episode. I am so excited that you are here. I do not take it lightly that you decided to hit that play button and spend about an hour of your time with me. So with that being said, I want you to know that I'm 100% invested in your self-awareness journey. So you better believe that every week I'm bringing my A game for providing you the tools necessary to live a more fulfilled, purpose-driven life. And so family, I want to remind you to please take a moment to leave a five-star rating and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Because as you know, I said a lot to go to touch one million hearts within the first two years of the podcast. And I can only do it with your help. So please remember to download each episode, share this conversation with at least four people you know, and repost on your favorite social media platform. Also, don't forget to click the join community link that's in the show notes so we can stay connected and continue the conversation. And I don't think I've told you just yet, family, but guess what? The Living Up True podcast is now on Audible. Yes. So when you are listening to your favorite book on Audible, you can also go on over and check out your girl, the Living Our Truth podcast on Audible. We are not streaming on Audible and I'm super uber excited about it. So just in case you did not know, the Audible now streams podcasts. So definitely click the link that's in the show notes where you see Audible recommendations so you can sign up for your free subscription today because the first 30 days are free, all right? So family, just in case you are watching this <laughs> watching this video on facebook.com forward slash living our truth or over on youtube.com forward slash Lakeisha Woodard, you're probably thinking, you're probably thinking, um, Keisha, you look very wintry today. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. I'm a little jazzed up today and a little wintry today because <laughs> I have some errands to, to run today and I'm meeting up with some friends today and it is cold and rainy in Houston, okay? So your girl is very much prepared for it. So that's why I'm all jazzed up on today. <laughs> But family, this week is week six. Week six. Are you excited? It is week six in the Strategize Your Vision series. And in case this is your very first time listening to the Living Our Truth podcast, let me brief you so you can catch up. This series is based on my Master Life class, Strategize Your Vision, which I teach you the step-by-step -step formula for building a rock-solid strategy to manifest your vision. So for the next eight weeks, we're going to continue the conversation about the blessing in embracing your purpose and how your mental wellness safety and security, personal development, professional growth, spirituality, faith, and support team building plays a part in your decision to operate in purpose. Now, week one, I laid the groundwork for the next for the 12 weeks, okay? And we went deep into purpose. We talked about what it means, why it's important, and the impact it will have on your life. And then week two, we talked about how to recalibrate our most valuable tool, our most valuable tool, that's our brain. So we can identify the purpose-driven opportunities for manifesting the life that we want. And then take action, okay? Because execution is important for manifestation. 
And then week three, we talked about what the process can look like for operating purpose with actionable steps and mindset resets so you can implement immediately, okay? And then in week four, we talked about how to pull power from our pain. So self-doubt, shame, or insecurities don't cloud out our judgment for operating purpose. And in week five, we talked about changing our home environment for a more supportive foundation to operate in purpose. So that was a mouthful, right? We cover a lot of ground in the last five weeks. So if you miss any of these episodes, go back and listen. And then listen a second time for taking notes. And don't forget to tag me on social media at Lakeisha Wooder to let me know, you know, your greatest takeaway from any of the conversations. All right. So family, I hope you're ready for today's conversation because it's special. And yes, I say that about all of my guests <laughs> because it's true. <laughs> We're all special and unique in our own way. And yet today's conversation is special because I'm sitting down with a father-son duo. Naeem Hudson is a teenage motivational speaker who is being raised by his father. And now the way this country, you know, has been depicting black men and black fathers, I had to have Naeem on the podcast with his father. Because like I told you in my conversation with Amari Maynard in episode 43 and 44, because it's a two-part episode, I'm making it my business to help change the narrative about black men. Because despite what you see or hear about them in the news, black men are taking care of their families. They're taking care of their children. And they are supporting black women. And like Amari's conversation, this conversation with Naeem and Dash will further confirm this point. Now, I know you're going to be, you know, so amazingly and so proud of Naeem, even though he's not your son. <laughs> Because, shoot, I was even more proud of this young man after having this conversation with him than I was before, you know, because I've been, I've been following his career journey for a couple of years now, you know, and his dad is definitely his backbone who has done or is doing the emotional work to break generational curses that have plagued his family. And yes, I say that a black man doing the emotional work on himself. It's not an oxymoron, people. Black men seek help too. But let me stop talking and introduce Naeem so you can get into this conversation. Naeem Hudson, aka King Na, is an international motivational speaker, artist, and author that captured the global and national celebrity attention and audiences. Naeem is one of 12 kids who rocked the world in 2016, according to the Huffington Post and Forbes. He has been interviewed and appeared on countless media platforms, including Good Morning America. And he has written his first book, We Are All Kings. It's a motivational guide for parents sharing his journey to encourage young boys to believe in themselves as kings of greatness. Family. Sit back and enjoy my conversation with Naeem and his father, Dash Hudson. Naeem and Dash, thank you so much for saying yes to having this conversation with me today. No problem. It's our pleasure. Uh, we're honored. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm super I'm super excited about this um, about this conversation. You know, here on the Living Her Truth podcast, you know, initially my audience is for women, but it's for men too because we talk about self awareness and what it means to live our own truth. Hey, family! Quick announcement: If you're ready to go deeper and would love to continue the conversation outside the podcast, then I have something just for you. I'm creating a safe, judgment-free community of like-minded people to grow and build the support team that we need to operate in purpose. If you want to join me, please visit livingherttruthpodcast.com and then click the join community button so we can partner together on your self-awareness journey. I am looking forward to getting to know each and every one of you. I am so excited to deep dive into your purpose. And we're going to have such a great time, you guys. I look forward to seeing you in the group. Now, back to the conversation. 
And I wanted to have you guys on here because I always like to have a youngin come on the podcast and give their perspective of purpose and living according to purpose. And having you here, Dash, it just makes it extra special because, you know, you're the dad and, you know, Black fathers need to be celebrated. You know, I think we need to hear from more Black fathers. And so if I can do that on my podcast, I'm more than willing, more than willing to do that. So I am honored to have you guys here, here on the podcast. So I love to start off every episode with just talking about how I come to know the people that I'm talking to. And this episode is no different. So um, King Na, Naeem. I was introduced to you. I don't even know when, probably a few years now, a cousin, my cousin sent me a Gold Coast video. I think it was Gold Coast video, but it was a video of you speaking and you was comparing um, seasoning to chasing your dreams. And because I'm a motivational speaker and I do a lot of sharing my own personal story, my cousin sent me this, this inspirational video. And so I watched this video and I'm like, who? is this kid like (laughs) like who is this kid he is so young but he's just you know just talking just so well and talking real knowledge and I just love how he was able to you know make the analogy between chasing your dreams and, and sneezing so of course I had to look you up on Instagram and started going through your content and love what I saw and I'm like man this is a, a pretty cool young man I started following you so I've been following you on Instagram for probably like a year and a half two years now and just love what you do and I swear it's like you growing up right before my eyes because you started off as this young kid and now you're tall. Your voice got a little deeper. I'm like, okay. <laughs> now you was growing up right before my eyes. So, so yeah, I'm super excited to, to have you here. But um, question, how old were you when you started motivational speaking? When you came a, became a speaker, how old were you? Um, I was eight years old. That was the time um, my father finally started to let me record and like have my own YouTube page. Like before that, I was always trying to get into stuff and trying to, you know, put myself out there. And my father, he was a, he was always a photographer. I always seen him like recording other people. And uh, the first time he finally let me on camera, you know, it wasn't even like a motivational speaking thing. It was just me just talking. Really, I forgot what it was about, like chocolate or something like that. Mm-hmm. Bar is gone, and then. From then on, it really just kind of merged into motivational speaking because I was just giving like helpful messages to other kids my age or to other people in the community. And it kind of just, motivational speaking just kind of swayed its way into my life. And that's how it happened. Hmm. So it was no defined decision of, oh, I'm just gonna be, I'm just gonna start speaking. It just kind of naturally happened. Yeah, it just came along. Like it was never something. Like at first, it was never something we sat down and talked about because when I was like five and six, I wanted to be a rapper. So I was always telling my dad, well, I want to rap, I want to rap, I want to rap. But then I seen this kid that like he heavily inspired me. Well, not a kid, he's like way older than me. But his name was Kid President. And when I seen him, he kind of inspired me and my dad. And that was the image that I tried to like, like I tried to like mimic a little bit. And then it really like, it just turned into my own thing. I love that. I love that. Um, Dash, I love the fact that you was able to um, just let him do his thing and just be free. I think a lot of parents um, sometimes put their dreams onto their kids. So when did you see entrepreneurship in your son? When did you see that he had a a knack for it? Um, Well, a little bit of my story, you know, uh, I grew up in the foster home system. You know, I was molested as a as a young man at six years old. Uh, growing up, not having a father, and growing up inside myself, meaning not being able to communicate, not being able to talk, not being able to express myself. So, when you grow and you learn, inadvertently, you 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 learn a skill or you get educated in an experience. So you may not have the wisdom and you may not have the knowledge to express that, but when you live that, 
that's what the journey manifests and that's what the journey becomes. So it wasn't about seeing my son and having a plan or allowing or wanting. The only thing that I knew in my head that I knew I grew up with a lot of pain. I knew I grew up with a lot of trauma. And if I grew up and I didn't appreciate or like how much suffering and pain that I've been through, I knew I couldn't even, I couldn't grow and duplicate that same system. So my parenting skills was just free. We were free. I really respect every word my son said. Speaking is an exercise. I always allow my son to speak. It's something we always say, noise is a language for a child that don't know how to speak yet. So even when my son was very young and he was making noises, I always looked at his eyes and I allowed him to communicate through his eyes, through his expression. So his face meant the world to me because his face spoke before his, his mouth ever verbalized words. So that's what I was engaged with, his expressions. And wherever his expressions went and whatever his most excitement was, that's what I lived for. So it wasn't about saying, I'm gonna let him do this, or I'm looking for this or this entrepreneur. He was happy. You know, I, I was directing a long time music videos, TV commercials, and you know, I got custody of Naeem when, when he was four. So I didn't have a choice but to have Naeem everywhere with me on set and everything I was doing. So his his mind was computing all of that. And it started out. Parents, we call it being bad. He would never sit down. Naeem, sit down. Naeem, stop. I got to work. And he's just jumping up. He want to get on stage. He want to be seen. He want to do something. So that's what I had to fight. Him just being ambitious. And as parents would say, him being hard-headed and not listening. Oh, my God. That is so beautiful that was so beautiful i'm so glad you decided to to join the conversation because that was so beautiful you know i, I thought you was going to say decide to let him i ain't, still to this day i ain't decide to let naeem do nothing he just forced his way <laughs> i never had a picture of my son online he wasn't on facebook he wasn't on nothing all my friends he, he got on everybody's nerve you you was going to see naeem you was going to see him. You was going to hear him. He fought for who he is. Mm, and you respected that fight. I love that. I love the fact that you said that you respected what your son had to say. Because growing up, for me, I always heard that, you know, kids should be seen and not heard. So you go somewhere and you sit down. Because um, even with one of my clients, she bowed that because she heard that a lot too growing up and that stifled her voice. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of things that she wanted to do in her career, like podcasting and singing and things like that. But she was afraid to use her voice because of what she's been told so much as a child. So the fact mm -hmm. that you respected that your, what your son had to say, even the noises before he was even able to talk, I think that is huge and let me you know applaud you give you your flowers while you're still here because you are an example of breaking generational curses mm. you are an example of that you know we have something in common i too was sexually abused by my mother's husband and it's for me it started when i was eight years old you know and for a long time i didn't think it was something that you know was common you know, mm -hmm. that, that happened until I started speaking when I was in college. And even then, I just thought that it only happened to little girls. And until I started speaking and little boys would come up and share with me that they were sexually abused. And that was my first time really hearing about little boys even being abused because I really thought it was something that just happened to, to little girls. So the fact that you, you know, are brave enough to admit that, like, man, my, my, my head goes off to you because sharing something so intimate, such an intimate part of you and so personal, it takes a lot of guts to do that. Because even right now today, when I speak, I still have grown women who come up to me after I get off the stage to say, wow, I could never have shared that. I experienced that too, but I could never have shared that. How do you have the confidence to, you know? So for you to share that, that's just, that's just amazing. That's just amazing. Well, for uh, <clears throat> the thing about it, uh, 
I would call it uh, like an eclipse, or even if you see the pyramids, depending on the angle when you're in Egypt, you can't see the other pyramids because, you know, our buildings, when you're behind something, it overshadows you. So for many years, like from when I was six years old to I was 23, 24, his mother was the first person I ever told. So for many years, trauma, trauma is internal cancer. You know, you, you hold it in, it grows, it eats you. And the thing about it is just like cancer, with cancer, uh, the sooner you find it and address it, it, I wouldn't say it eases your pain, but you will understand it. So for many years and for many men, I don't think you even tap into that space because you don't have the words. So it owned me. It overshadowed me. It blocked me from becoming. It blocked me from understanding myself. It blocked my potential. It turned into anger. It turned into frustration. I was angry. I was frustrated. This is what created my space in the foster home system. I didn't understand the process. I didn't understand how to verbalize. Every feeling and word is an emotion and a picture. I didn't understand that picture and I didn't understand the words and the emotions that was attached to that experience. So as a man that I'm able to create the words for that experience, it no longer overshadows me. And when you have fathers that don't show up, when you have men and you have a generation of young men that's angry, that's violent, that feel invisible, because in class, I was being told I had ADHD, I was dumb, I was angry, I was aggressive, but people were just looking at the icing and the icing is not the cake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People want their favorite cake, they say chocolate, they say vanilla, they're, they're really talking about the icing. So I wasn't bad, I wasn't evil, I wasn't angry, that was just the top layer of me protecting myself. So if you, if you, if you got underneath that, it was pain, it was trauma, it was devastation. So if we learn to look at that, when you see a young man and you see him looking frustrated or you see him masking or you see him well, masking his pain, looking angry, looking aggravated, looking traumatized, ask what's underneath that. Ask what's, you know, how can you get behind that? And it's still a battle. Every day, you know, I, I battle emotional spaces and trauma. You know, because I always say you can't edit your soul. And any given moment and day is just things that trigger that space. And my son was a part of my healing. He's still a, a part of my healing. You know, it's a quote that I said, for uh, a man that grew up without a father can heal himself by being there for his son. You know, so the love that I had to build and develop to raise this young man so when he's in Africa speaking to 20,000 people, when he's in Mexico, a lot of people didn't know that that was my tears. That was my frustration. That was my, that was, you know, like all my life, I just seen him with my face and I never wanted him to feel my pain, my struggles and my trauma. So people didn't know how an eight year old could get on stage and talk to 10,000 people like dedication, time, love, attention. Just everything, my whole soul went into this young man. And um, that's it. That's a part of that. It's therapy. It's therapeutic. Uh, conversation is a push-up. It's a muscle. The more you talk, the more you can educate yourself, the more you understand yourself, the more you understand your situation, your environment. And um, he is an extension of my growth and development, you know? If my father could do it over and be me, I did what I wish my father did for me, for my son. I absolutely love that. And I agree with you that it requires, you know, going deep. Um, for me, on my healing journey, I needed to go deep. Yeah. I really needed to get below the, the surface and really get to know who I am as a person in order to push past the trauma and push past the hurt. And, you know, and, and as a self-awareness coach, I've been told many a times that <laughs> my material is way too deep. And I'm like, I don't know what other way to be. Hold on, not to cut you off, but we need to catch it. Not to cut you off, but we need to catch, he, he's patting me on my back. 
so he, he's worried about me. So we're gonna give it all. I'm guessing this. We was worried about it, man. Yeah, I was literally did that because you're doing a good job. Okay, this, give me this is the first time I see you doing an interview. Come on, don't act like you don't love me because we on camera. We on camera, so you know, act like a, a teenager. I apologize. He, he was worried about me. Like oh. usually, he's too cool for me now. So yeah. I was patting his back was because, like, he's doing good in the interview. Literally, so I was like. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, how do you feel listening to listening to your dad talk and share his story, and for you to witness, you know, his his healing process? Like, how do you feel just hearing about that? Um, hearing about it, like hearing him like express himself. Yeah. It feels like different. You hear it every day. I'm, I know, <laughs> but like, that's usually when you're talking to people. Like, you're talking. To the world. To, to, to be talking to a whole bunch of people. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's most definitely different. Like, I wouldn't, I would have never expected him to be on camera or on an interview like this, just speaking about, you know, his his trauma or what he's been through as a kid. He's never done it before. <clears throat> he, well, he was I'm- offered like seven, he was offered like seven TV shows. When he did Good Morning America, they wanted me on there. When he did Little Big Shots, when he did the eyes so I never wanted to do none of this stuff I never had an interest so it's something that me and my son used to always say no excuses make history mm-hmm. so I was always able to hide with like I don't feel like doing that stuff until like my son talked to me and he started hitting me with some of the same stuff I used to tell him and then as I started speaking and talking in the inboxes and the messages and everything that I started to get I started to realize that this is way bigger than me and it's not about me. It's not about what I feel like doing. Like so many fathers, so many young men, so many people. Like, so I see my son impact the world, you know, and not to say I never seen myself play a part. And also with me going to therapy, you know, my therapist helped me see, mm-hmm. I, I, stu- I suffer from that invisibleness. So even like traveling the world, from Namibia, uh, Tanzania, Johannesburg, Mexico, all around the world, like I don't have no pictures of myself with him. Like I, so, it's like really? something that my therapist allowed me to see. Like I still feel like I'm invisible. So inadvertently, I've no, I don't want to do TV. I don't want to. But his story and our story is a story that needs to be told. And I, I not not that I feel like I dropped the ball. I feel like everything takes time because I wasn't ready. Wasn't ready to speak about my situation it still played a major part on my emotional space and um so y'all you guys are experiencing this in, in, in the same time that i'm growing in it you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i love that and and you know that can be that is a part of uh the healing process and that was probably like three layers deep you been you not want to be on TV, not wanting to be on TV um, because you still feel in invisible. You know that definitely could be related to the trauma. So I can totally get that. You know I, I saw the video of uh, Naeem on um, Good Morning America and it actually come out and she was like, "No, Dad said it's his time. It's his it's his spotlight." And I was like, "Oh, that is so sweet." I, I, I used to be so serious, like, "No, no, I mess we like I want to say miss the opportunity is going to come." Wow. I, was, I was so serious about that stuff. Like I didn't want no parts. Nobody used to always tell me, he's like, if they ask me if I want to go on, say no. <laughs> tell them your dad does not want to be on the show. He don't want to be on TV. <laughs> Hilarious. That's why even if you see his face, he's like, oh my dad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you no. Know, and I used to sit back and I used to see so many stories. Like people used to be like, oh, his father's Chinese. He don't want to get on camera. And I used to, I used to just look at this stuff like, you know, oh, his mothers and fathers are doctors and lawyers. And people are so funny on the internet because you'll swear they actually got some secret information, you know, because we, nobody like responsibility. Nobody want to go. No, his father got a real story and they have a real story. It's not cheesy, it's not empty, it's full of, it's, it's truly a fight, it's truly work, it's truly dedication to be, you know, 
it's not just this little fairy tale of this little kid. Mm-hmm. You know, we really have a real situation and we're still growing and learning. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know what? I'm glad that you waited until you were um, felt comfortable enough and was further enough down in your healing journey to even speak your story, you know, because to do it prematurely probably would have been a disservice to somebody else, you know, because how are you able to communicate the words that, you know, yeah. thoughts, you know, through your lips if you hadn't healed from yet and, you know, and received a full understanding for yourself first before talking to someone else so I commend you on that that's that takes a lot of strength it takes a lot of courage it takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength because and and one of the things I wanted to ask you about uh, being jealous of your son you know because that could have happened you know your son is getting all this attention and things like that because parents some parents are like that Mm -hmm. you know where their child is more talented you know more well known or just more popular than them or how they were when they was at that age and so there's jealousy sometimes so how do you keep that separate from not being jealous of Naeem's success to be honest we probably two of the most people that don't care <laughs> like like me and my son my son be in the park he would be like oh you that kid he'd be like like when he get like we just be in the park we just live regular lives. Like my I'm, mom just called me like today actually, because one of her employees was like, "Oh my God, this son was trending on my timeline. Can you call him? Can I talk to him?" And she was like, "Oh my God, so how does like how does this feel? Like you trending all over Instagram, and Twitter? That? You today. trending today? No, she was saying that she had seen me on her timeline okay. or something. It's like, do you feel like? Hey, how does that feel? It's like, I mean, it feels great. <clears throat> like, is people gotta tell? Like, people call him and tell him who follow him. When he go viral, like we're just, and I don't know, I, I guess, uh, see, just in my life, right? I, I battle, I not battle, uh, Junior, right? Junior is what my family called me. Okay. Yeah, Junior, Junior didn't know how to read until he was 17, 18. Junior, mm-hmm. Junior is that young man that keeps me humble. Junior is the young man that. Like I said, you can't edit your soul. So we could be traveling the world. <clears throat> and even before my son, like when I was shooting content for, for the, like the mayor of North New Jersey and like I'll be in rooms full of, this is the mayor, these are lawyers, these are these important people. And Junior be like, man, what you doing here? You know you ain't got no business in, in this room. Like you, you are nobody. Like So that, that, that voice and that humility of my foundation a foundation is very, very uh, loud, and it used to be destruct. Uh, it used to be a distraction, and it used to be an inconvenience. But I think I needed that education of that experience to keep me balanced. Mm-hmm. My son, we have that same world, so it's like I talk to people, I meet people, and it's like we honestly, I. I don't like even when you said that thought, I, I it computed in my mind because I, I thought it when you said it, but that thought it's never been a thought. Like, yeah, I've never been thought about it like that. Like, mm-hmm. that was, like I just know he jealous. Like, he, I'm just doing all this and he's just over here. <clears throat> Trust me, like anything I ever did helped him with, I put his name on it. If I direct something, he did it. Only time he's ever been jealous of me in anything is when I went on a 14 game winning streak in 2K. Yeah, I guess it's stuff like that we joke on now. Like, he have hair, I don't. So he think I want hair. He do, because he <laughs> he's always telling me, man, you need to cut that stuff off your head. Yeah, I, I just I just think he needs to do something different with that. But that's a part of like. And he's it, just jealous because. You know, I, I, I'm okay. Like, you know. So, so, so we took with this kind of stuff. Um, like I say, we still, we still learning. And that's the thing about parenting, 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 because you can't love the same child because you have to get used to evolution. You love something that's growing. And it's a lot of parents that's stuck in the middle of the four-year-old and the five-year-old that they love and appreciate it. 
You can't stay stuck there. You have to, you have to find a balance and you have to understand you love something that has its own mind outside of you. And he, he is not, even in the branding, like they want him to be the Fila kid. Like he's not that kid. That was one minute video. It was an expression. You know, any other pair of sneakers he put on, he got a whole, oh, I'm disgusted in you. You let me down. I'm unfollowing you. You're a disgrace. And it's like, you know, I have my things. Like I say, the hair, I let him be him. The earring, no thing. And I'd be like, hey, where are you going, young man? And I, and I just listen to what he feel and what he like. Children are a blank canvas and they're painting themselves every day. And it's not for me to define what he should paint for himself. It's just for me to, I just try my best to understand because he, I could tell like, as soon as I came in the interview, he like probably, daddy, take that hood off and that hat. Like, I don't know. I don't care about that. No, but we we just be critiquing each other sometimes. No. Um, no. Yes, you do. You always critique me. You tell me. I'll like, be, I be playing. No, you know, if, if, if I put my hat a certain serious. way, you don't, you don't need to look like that. You, you know. No, because you, you wear your hats the same two ways. Okay, good. So we just, we just growing. We growing and um, he watched me grow and I'm trying to figure myself out. And I watch him grow. I watch him go from, he used to be a young man. I want a lot of love. But loves. I remember the first day he pulled his hand from me crossing the street. I was devastated. <laughs> Because, you know, it was like, it was like my baby, what is he doing? I remember the first day he changed me from his screensaver. So it, it's like, it's like stupid father stuff. <laughs> but you know what? I, I don't have any kids yet, but I can relate because when my niece went off to college and I called her while she was in school and she was with her little friends and she didn't want to talk to me, my little heart was broken. I was crying. I was like, <gasps> You don't want to talk to me anymore, and my husband just laughing at me like I cannot believe. I'm like, this is a this is a big deal. Like, you don't want to talk to my baby auntie anymore, so I can relate. That's too. Because the difference, I think, with us, because we are like a younger generation, so we still think we cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'm not like I don't see me hanging with my mother because it's like a bigger age difference, and my mother, my mother mm -hmm. I'd be like, oh yeah, naive, but they like, nah, dad, like. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I, I don't know. I didn't mean it. <clears throat> no. That's too funny. That's too funny. So, Naeem, how much of your, your dad's experience impacts your, your speeches when you go and motivate people? You know what? I will say, like, I think about people who probably went through the same trauma as him or went through something similar as him. And I try to, like, kind of verge my message in there because, you know, we... It is people in the world who, who aren't comfortable sharing their story. They aren't comfortable talking about how they feel or what they've been through or what they've gone through. And, you know, like just making my message more to the point of just knowing your self-worth, knowing your self-value. Because when things, when traumatizing things happen in people's lives, people start to take away from themselves. Like they start to degrade themselves because of something that's happened to them. And, you know, I try to, like, even when I talk to some of my friends, they tell me some of the things that they've been through and how they feel like what, they, what they've what they gone through takes away from who they are as a person. You know, it's, it's all about just knowing how much you mean to someone or how much you mean to someone else. Or, like, everyone has a purpose. Everyone has value. Everyone means something. But you only mean as much as you allow yourself to mean. Like, you can't determine how much you mean to the next person or the next person or the next person but you can determine how much you mean to yourself. And when you hold yourself at the highest level of value, then you're the most valuable. And that's what I, that's what I try to tell everyone, especially people who've been through trauma because they start to look at themselves differently. Mm -hmm. You are such a wise, wise young man. Um, I just love you. So let me ask you this. Do you think that you are operating purpose? Do you think you have fully identified and embraced your purpose and operating your purpose? I would say so, yes, because it's like, even when I'm not motivational speaking, mm -hmm. I do my best to encourage people. Like one thing, like one thing, one person I am in my friend group, when everyone has a problem going on at home or they got problems with school, everyone comes to me. Like they come to Naeem, they talk to Naeem. So like I'm a motivational speaker on stage mm -hmm. and motivational motivator off stage. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I could totally relate to that. I'm that person too in, in my little group. When people need encouragement, I'm the one that they call. And when they need an accountability partner, I'm the one that they call too, because I'm really um, disciplined and I strive with structure. So yeah, yeah. So I'm, that, I'm that person too. Now your dad kind of mentioned how we are a little closer in age, you know, you and him, as opposed to, you know, us and our parents. So I want to ask you this. Do you think that our generation, me and your dad's generation, do you think that we have properly prepared your generation to deal with like racism and social injustice and all of this crazy stuff that's happening in the world today as it relates to black people? Well, I wouldn't say yes or no, because with this generation, like everything that's happened is really unexpected, especially with social media and television. Like you can't, like you, you can't prepare for something that you weren't expecting. And I say like, I say one thing that's really preparing kids the most and like, you know, children are, and, and teenagers are different. Like it depends on the child. I say what, prepared, what prepares kids the most is social media because this is when you're gonna see stuff the most. Like if you're not going through it, like personally, you're gonna see it on social media. You're gonna hear about it. Like it's eventually gonna pop up. and allow yourself to build certain perspectives on how you look at things. So it's just how if you get exposed to something positive early on in your life, it's naturally gonna adapt into your lifestyle without you doing much of anything. And if you're exposed to something negative, it's gonna merge into your life without you doing anything because that's, that's teaching you. Cause like when you look at teenagers, a lot, of, a lot of kids are starting to verge away from their parents. So their parents' words and their parents' like advice, they can look at it and go, Man, this really doesn't matter because they could think a different way. Cause it's like every mind, every thought process, everyone that's just logging on to social media and they see these different things that's going on in the news. However, they look at it and whatever source they go to, that's how they're gonna view it. It's gonna be that perspective. So when you share positive things, I'd say I think one way parents could like reach out to their kids more if they do have the kid that's more like in social media and stuff like that is to share the positive stuff is to share the things that you would want your child to look at and go you know wow that was deep or wow that really helps me a wow, lot that changes my perspective because with social media this is the biggest influence of like it's no longer celebrities it's no longer like artists it's like it's social media anything that is being done on social media anything that's being Anything that's a trend on social media is now being followed. So if a kid is logging onto social media and they see something about racism, but it's putting a positive spin on it, they're gonna start to think, you know what? Maybe this is right or or like it's just however they look at it. It's different, like I said, because every person's mind is different. But I say social media is really what's preparing kids the most. <clears throat> wow. Because it's also about the process. And the thing about learning, it's uh, how did that information, uh, how did that, how were you introduced to the information? So the thing about like slavery movies, when we talk about racism, mm -hmm. a lot of people introduce, a lot of people introduce it with an emotional impact with it. So if you're showing me Martin Luther King or you're showing me slavery movies, now I have a negative, I have a negative vibration that happens. So it makes me angry. It makes me feel mad. It makes me feel. So think about if you learn about, like when people are teaching you about things they love, yeah. like, or imagine math, like somebody teaching you math, but it was math people that came and then they took the numbers and they hung the numbers. And like, you know, once you emotionally impact me and traumatize me, I can't take this information and make it beneficial to me. So if you're looking at racism like a problem, you know, what do you want me to do when you're teaching me this? Do you want me to just feel it? Do you want me to understand it, overstand it, or create a solution for it? So if you want me to create a solution for something, I don't think I should be emotionally impacted or you have to teach me the context before you just show a, a kid something that emotionally impacts them. Because information, like I said, words, have a picture. So inadvertently when, we, when we're saying racism, we're saying slavery, and then slavery was the picture. So the same thing, when you, when, when you say love, 
to multiple people, love, love could turn into how many times they was rejected. So now someone run away and, and you think they hate you, but they just hate that they love you because everybody that they love hurts them. So now they run away from that word because that word has a negative picture to it. And for children to be new, for children to be thinkers, for children to be innovative, for children to be problem solvers, they need to understand the context and break down everything. Mm -hmm. They could understand every part and piece of it. If you want them to be solution-based and not just feel the word, but think about it in its fullness. And you know, <clears throat> that's the part. And, and process is important, you know, because in this day and time, people feel stupid because they got to think. So if we don't know something right now, it's like, yo, Google it. Go look at it on YouTube. And now you delete a whole process that has to happen. If I don't know something, I could think about it. That's giving my mind, your brain is a muscle. Mm -hmm. You do push-ups, you're watching your body and you're watching your arms build a muscle. So now when I have to think about something, my mind is developing. And now I'm building and an, an, that emotional intelligence that I need to be able to thrive in this world and not just survive. I love that. So Naeem, you're saying to communicate, parents need to communicate with, with their kids because if not, then they're going to get their influence and the information from social media. And then Dash, you're saying it's a process, right? Uh, we want to be able to give our child the full context of what it is that we want to communicate with them. I 100% agree, but how do you do that as a parent if you don't even know how to... Um, communicate in that way if nobody has ever taught you how to communicate in that way if you don't um really understand your own emotions and and feelings like how do you communicate that to your child in a way where he or she can actually understand and 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 follow the instructions or even take what you have to say into consideration okay I have a book I'm working on called Puzzle Pieces. Okay. So Puzzle Pieces is about, I'm actually giving my son pieces that I never had in my life. Mm -hmm. Okay. The first thing I had to do was separate what I never learned, separate what I thought was valuable information because mm -hmm. we just passed down information because it's all we have. It's not that it, it, it worked. Mm -hmm. How do I teach my son mm -hmm. same love that made me feel empty? You know, how could I give my son that same, you know, shut up, you should be seen and you shouldn't be heard. And how, if I knew I felt like I was in hell every day, how could I pass that down? And sometimes we just continue to pass hell down because it's all we have. And all we know. <clears throat> all right. Parents is just a word, okay? Mm -hmm. A human that's growing. See, and what parents do, they want to seem like they write all the time. They want to seem like they're never wrong. They want to seem like they know everything. So once you do that, you allow yourself to be seen in one perspective. This is what I tell my son. I might get it wrong sometimes. You're going to see me cry. You're going to see me hurt. I'm going to apologize. I may have to, we may have to unlearn everything I taught you so we can relearn it all over again. Mm -hmm. I don't put this big pressure on myself because my son know that my father is growing just like me. Mm. You, <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. and, and if you, if you ask me, like, where did I learn how to be a father? Where did I develop my emotional skills that I'm passing down to you? So when I go, I was in a foster home. I wasn't molested. I was molested. I've been through all of this trauma. I'm through a healing space where I may make mistakes because I never developed this emotional space that I need to grow and pass down to you. Mm -hmm. So for the parents out there, stop and pause. Stop and pause and allow yourself to fully process. You know, it's a quote that says, let's raise children that won't have to recover from their childhood. Mm -hmm. My parents to ask themselves, 
are, are, are they fully bloomed and blossom or are they just in survival mode? And have you been in survival mode so long that you think that's you? Yeah. Parents and people, they think that they're, they think that they are their pain. They think they are their, their trauma. And that's what this world tried to make you believe. Like, oh, you something's wrong with you when you no, something happened to me. And I'm trying to unravel this experience. But this experience used to make me angry. This experience used to make me feel invisible. This experience used to make me feel depressed. And it's something that I say, you know, every interaction is a transaction. So if I have all this pain and suffering in me, now everything I love is going to have a piece of that pain and suffering. So real simple, parents, stop putting all the pressure on yourself. Stop feeling like you have to know everything. Allow yourself <clears throat> to process yourself and allow yourself. <clears throat> it's, it's something I just was joking with my mother about because my mother, no matter what you say to her, She'll go, oh, no, not to my knowledge. You know, she, she'll say not to my knowledge. And she she's okay with saying that. I'm like, mom, you will click away from having some new knowledge. Why don't you get some more knowledge so you could just stop saying not to my knowledge? Like, why are we okay with staying with system that was just handed down to us with through survival mode? Like, I don't want my son to just survive. I want him to live, you know? So us seeing the world, us traveling the world, me growing with him, we grew together. We are a team. So we need to stop seeing our children as like peasants and little people under us. No, my son's words matter just like my, my words matter. And I respected him ever since I seen his eyes blink. And that's what we need to do. Like, he is important. And I said this on one of my videos, like mm -hmm. parents pray for miracles and ignore their children. Who are the miracle? Yeah, like look, look at like, people be like, yo, what you do for a living? I be like, uh, I just raised my son. Like, and that's it. We, and of course it takes skills and development videography, but I capture our journey. And this is how we travel the world. This is how we're gonna have TV shows. This is how we're gonna motivate, inspire, empower great generational curses. At the same time, I'm going through therapy just by loving my son, you know? And at the same time, processing and making sure he don't feel invisible and I'm making sure I'm not parenting out of pain. Mm. We're learning and I want him to be healed. And I want, I'm thinking, like when we doing business and thinking, I'm like, man, I'm worried about your son, you know? Because the mind that's download, downloaded in the same love and the lessons he's learning, he's going to love his son with. Mm -hmm. I'm building a heart. I'm building a mind that I value. And people say, oh, this is men that I did. This is the worst uh, generation of men. But who was in charge of the men when we were boys? Not to blame it on anybody. We need to rebuild, because I don't think we build this system out of a positive space. We built these systems that we're raising each other out of survival mode and they need to be rebuilt. They need to be reprogrammed. We need a new curriculum on parenting and love and affection. Like why do we have a universal language of, oh, kids should be seen and not heard. We all heard that. You know, we need positive things, you know. We need, like children are like refrigerators. They only have what you put in them. Like these things should be viral through a parenting experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to be a parent. I'm learning how to be a parent. Mm. I absolutely love that. You know, and I, man, you just said so much. And I just really hope that people really hear what you got to say, really hear what you just said, because that's going to set so many parents free. And I think you know, some parents, depending on how old they are, because my mom listening to you will probably be like, oh, whatever, because yeah. like, I'm the mama, you the child, right? So you have that, that, that boundary and that respect, but it's just like, but mom, I still would respect you. I'm gonna respect you regardless because you're my mom, but I can have even more respect for you if you're willing to say, hey, I'm human. I'm growing, we growing together, especially when you had me at 16 years old. Ma'am, we growing. <laughs> yeah. 
okay, okay, we're, we're yeah. growing together. And, and that's okay. But I think a lot of parents do put that pressure on themselves to have to know it all and to be perfect, you know, um, in order to, to raise that, to raise their kid. But I love the fact that you said that you're not even just thinking about Naeem, but you're thinking about his son. Like, man, if my daddy would just thought about my kids. <laughs> <laughs> now, only about me, but you didn't think about my kids either. So now I gotta call my daddy, but like pops. <laughs> it's, it's important. Like he just bought two K twenty one. When you buy that game and download it, they are already working on two K twenty two. It's not like I can't just. It's not about just your mind and your heart. And why would I? Why would I make you invisible? And like I'm the. Like, think about what parents are to us. And if the most important person in the world make you invisible, how do you introduce your space to anyone else? You know, and someone asked me that. I forgot. I think we were in, um, uh, I don't know. I think we were in, like, T.D. Jake's church in Houston. He, he spoke. Mm-hmm. And, they, and he asked me, man, like, how did you build his confidence? And, and I had to think. And I really was thinking. I'm like, I'm like, I just, I just never broke it down to build it. It was just. How about that? Yeah. Like, and that's the thing. It's like, you go through the education system or the quote unquote, whatever system it is, you be needing a whole new life. You be needing a whole new life, a whole new heart. Cause they tear you down so much. Mm-hmm. Mental trickery. Something I say too, like emotionally transmitted diseases, you know? Like we're so impacted and so traumatized and we're so, we don't even understand like that we're walking around just impacting people. And I say help can't help help. You need help, I need help, he need help. And we just all just killing each other. No freedom. So to be revolution, revolution starts in the heart. Revolution starts, you know, with me seeing your soul and treating it like it's mine, you know? So I can't lie to him. I can't, you know, and then, and then like literally my son could go back and you can mute me. I live like my son, like I don't ever want you to see me and lose respect for me. I don't ever want to like put myself in harm's way. You know, my son made me want to live. My son made me want to fight. My son, my son made me feel reborn again. You know, because I had the opportunity to to make a heart not feel what I felt. And um, and then like you know, that's why another thing. If you ask me, what's one of the greatest things that ever happened to me, or what's my biggest lesson? My biggest lesson in blessing. It's being molested, mm. being in a foster home. Like you remove that. Do I even know how to be? <laughs> remove that. He probably don't even know me. <laughs> I'm probably in the club turning up right now. Like that, that trauma humbled me. That trauma, you know, sat me down. That trauma showed me a different level of love. Mm. So, you know, we discredit our blessings. We discredit the things that make us who we are. So even though it caused me so much pain, even though it it owned me, it also gave me the heart I have. And it also gave me, I, I always say, your perception and perspective controls your reality. You know, and I see with the pain that was created through my experience. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and um, I don't regret it. I don't regret what it made me. Of course, of course, I will go back and rescue me. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. I agree. I, I agree with you. I feel the same way about, about uh, my experience with sexual abuse. Um, I feel like because that happened, I that built up my, my thick skin, my perseverance, and my determination. Um, if you take that away from me, eh, there's no telling that's gonna tell me why I be. I probably still in the hood in Chicago, probably with seven, eight kids by like eight different baby daddies, to be completely honest with you. <laughs> For real. <laughs> like, I said, like, like now you would be like, where's my dad? And I'm like, 
<laughs> Hello, who is this? I'm your son. I don't got no son. Like, you know what I mean? like, <laughs> Yeah, 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 absolutely. I don't, I don't got no son. I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, Naeem, do you feel pressure to be perfect, to be this perfect person? You know, because you're a motivational speaker after knowing everything that your dad has gone through and all of the love and time and energy he's putting into you to be, you know, the best version of you. Do you feel any pressure that comes with that? Well, of course I feel pressure when it comes to being my best self. Mm -hmm. To being perfect, not really. I don't say that people that pressure me to be perfect in social media. I don't even think I can use the bathroom a certain way (laughs) and and not get a slander. (laughs) But like, you know, me, just being the type of person I am, like when people have those expectations of me to be perfect, like, when I just listen to the stuff that people say and read the messages that people send, it's like, they say, I'm disappointed in you because you're wearing this kind of sneaker or you dribble this way in basketball. I just look at it and go, well, it's not much I can do about that because that's their perspective and that's what they think. Like, they're all human beings and the same people behind the screen on the keyboard that's typing all this stuff has their own life problems going on. They got their own secrets. They got their own things that if it was ever put out in this world, they would be embarrassed about. But of course, no one would speak about it because the pressure that they put on you isn't even the pressure that they put on themselves. Like no one, I'm not going to say no one, but half the people that could comment on these celebrities, comment section, and not even celebrities, but daily people that work hard every day, if they could be in their comment section saying, oh, you need to work on this, or you need to get better at this, they're not even working on themselves. They're telling other people what they should be working on, which means they're distracted and they're focused on the wrong thing. So when I see people telling me that I need to wear this and do this, I just think, you know what? It's okay. They just focused on the wrong thing. Like I was actually just writing in my notebook, like you can't be mad at people for what they weren't taught. If they weren't taught to work hard, if they weren't taught to chase their goals and be successful, but they're chasing everybody else's goals and chasing everybody else's success, then Hopefully one day they find their way, but sometimes with most people, all you could do for them is hope for the best. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can't be mad at people for what they wasn't taught. I absolutely, I absolutely love that. Do you think um, your your followers in your community, I mean, because I just said at the the beginning how I feel like you are literally growing up right before my eyes. Do you think people are, are giving you that grace and space? to like grow up I mean I I am forever a one minute video nine-year-old boy in some people's hearts and you know what I'm okay with that if I'm the feline kid for the rest of my life to the day I am not on this earth anymore I am fine with that if that's what people see it's like you just gotta let people think what they're gonna think you gotta let people see what they're gonna see like like what what kind of person am I to be trying to convince someone else that I'm a completely different person? I don't have time for that. Like I'm living my life, I'm chasing my dreams, I'm playing 2K, I'm happy. I'm in my head, I'm succeeding, and I have so much more success and things to accomplish. I'm not gonna chase this other person down and be like, well, look at this. I'm not the one minute video anymore. I've done this, I'm doing that, I'm doing that. Like that's just wasting my time. I got so many other things that I could be focused on, like keeping my winning streak alive in the game than worried about what other people feel and have to say. Mm-hmm. What I try to explain him that, you know, he, he is a glimmer of hope for people. Yeah. So, you know, I would say when you inspire, you're held accountable for the inspiration. Time is not even that. People don't want you to change, you know, especially in growing up. Like so many mothers and so many parents, there's not a lot of images of positive young men, positive black, young black men or whatever the case. And um, you would have hope, you would have inspiration. So, and that's why like we did have to tone his brand down and some of the things he talked about. And I was very careful with that because he always used to get, you're Jesus, you're the next president, you're the next this and you're the next that, you're the next Martin Luther King, you're the next Michael Max. And I'm like, I ain't be you, be you. You know, 
at the same time, it is a brand space you're building and people do respect you, but there's nothing you can't do because and I was his father, like he is really a great young man, you know, and I don't care about no brand, like, and his father is like, I tried to do everything in the world, whatever it was to be a bad kid, I tried to do it, <laughs> you know? So he is perfect if you compare him to like me and the kids I knew. He, 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 he's a beautiful soul. Like, and I genuinely mean that. And even though I get on him about simple stuff, make your bed, stop being on the toilet seat, I do not. <laughs> you know, because it's like we two grown humans and now you got you a man now. Like, so this ain't like baby pee no more. Like, I don't feel like cleaning this stuff. Like we two grown humans, you know, <laughs> so it's different now. Like, so it's simple stuff, but it's baby stuff. And even his like issues with me, like he he's amazing. Like, you know, he's cool. He cool. And parents, that's what we do. Like, so sometimes I stare at my son, like when he cool. My son's cool. He cool. Yeah, we 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 love your son. We do. <laughs> um, he's he's cool. He's cool. But how how do you keep how do you keep a level head when people say things like, "Oh, you're the next MLK. You're the next Jesus. You're the next president." How do you keep a level head? Because you are pretty dope. You pretty dope. How do you keep a level head. I'm really just a chill person, <laughs> like. When people when people say things and like they put like pressure on me, like I'll look at it, I'll take it into consideration, like, okay, this is a person that's inspired, they're motivated. But it was never like, oh my God, people have all these expectations and what am I gonna do? What am I gonna say? It's like I'm really just always relaxed. Like I'm in my own zone. Like if I'm not just laughing, being goofy or like the, the time that I've ever, like the most I've ever gotten like mad at something or felt pressure in something is when I'm actually playing basketball. Like I'm losing like bad. Like that's the only time you'll ever see me outside of my level head itself. So, like <laughs> other than that, I'm walking around the house and like I just have this face all day. Like I'm just a play fiend. I'm just relaxed. So it's like when I just see things and I see like people inspired and motivated, I have no problem with like expectations that people have. But it's like one thing I do try to make one thing I do try to make clear to people is like I am going to be who I am going to be. I am a 15 year old young man and I have so much life ahead of me. I don't know what changes I'm going to make in my future. I don't know what I'm going to be and what I'm going to do because when I was nine, I still thought I was going to be playing with Ninja Turtle action figures for the rest of my life. But things eventually change. So it's like just keeping my eyes open for the future and, you know, making sure people know that I'm going to do whatever in my life makes me happy or I feel like benefits me. And the thing about it, like the same thing I try to tell him, like, cause you, when do you get old to travel the world, see the world? It's like when you already did that at eight, <laughs> when you like, like, you know, my, it was my first time in, in Africa with Tanzania and he nine and like, and then we done been there, you know, uh, Namibia, Tanzania, Johannesburg, and it's like, you know, so I don't, I don't even know how he's going to process that. Like we talk about it <clears throat> and I ask him those questions. Like, do you understand how big you are? Do you understand this? And we, we watch old clips. He just had a revelation, like me showing him some old clips he never seen. You know, but you know, that's the difference also with this generation that they 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 they're so documented. Literally, I have his whole life on camera. Like, like when I look at me traveling and stuff and being on TV, like when you accomplish when you accomplish so many big things, like the little things become simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like. Well, the little things become the big things. Right? Yeah, the little things become yeah. the big things. He, like, gets, he gets super happy. You know, like, like <laughs> the most excitement that I've had, like, in this past few months is going to the movies with all of my friends. Like, <laughs> that was, like, so big for me. It was like, wow, it, I'm it, at the movies with all of my friends. It's like, what yeah. you got to go see? 
we seen like on we seen some movie. I didn't even care about the movie. I'm just like I'm here with my friends. We taking pictures. We relaxing. We having a good time. That's what was most important to me. Like just going to the mall with this one friend that I knew for my entire life. Like that's what makes me. That's what makes me happy. Like I say, the pinnacle to my happiness is doing. Like I love being around people. Like when I'm just by myself, it's like man, it's so boring. When I'm around like my family or my friends, like I want to travel one day with a whole bunch of our family members and my friends. I think like that would make a trip so much better because trips are already beautiful. Mm-hmm. But I want to travel with people who like this experience for them is just like. <clears throat> I and that's also I asked him that one time. I said, you know, if you do anything in the world. He said, I want to go to the mall. And I'm like, you know, and it's just, it's just simple stuff, but it's not even simple stuff. It's like, I, I remember when I, I used to hear about Michael Jackson, they said he used to put a mask on and walk around the mall. And it's like, you know, and, it, and it's about that balance. And that's, that, that, that has been like the plus in this situation with, with uh, COVID, because this is like his first time since he was nine, like almost having a whole year. We used to be on the road like two to three th- times uh, a month, kind of. You want me to go to the charter? This is going to be good. Do you get the chance to have a lot of interviews where you could just kind of like freely talk about yourself so people can get to know you a little bit more? Because you probably do like a lot of sound bites, huh? Yeah, like like the last few like interview things I did was with like Nickelodeon and like it was this uh, national award thing. So it was really just like, it was basically like an event because they were like events, but they were just like events. But you know, yeah, all of the events is on, is online and everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This has been amazing. I've really, really enjoyed talking to you guys um, tonight. And Dash, I'm so happy that you, you know, joined the conversation because like I said, I was a little bit nervous because I saw that one video and dad was like, no, I want to be on camera. This is his time. And I was like, I'm going to ask anyway right? Close mouth, don't get fed. So I'm so glad to have both of you guys here on the podcast. But before I let you go, Naeem, I got to ask you, because I always ask my guests, what book have you read or Audible book, because I'm addicted to Audible, but what book have you read or listened to that has inspired you in some way? I've actually been, I've actually been reading a lot of books. I was just reading one, like before we started the interview. Mm -hmm. I would say Jay Z's book Decoded. That's one of the books that I've really been enjoying. Uh, I say the reason why I enjoy that book so much is because when you look at someone who has been through so much, but they still are able to accomplish so much as well with all the things and pain that they experienced, and especially when it when it's a person that that looks like you and you see where they've come from and how much they've succeeded, it, it, it inspires you. You see Jay-Z, he's a billionaire now. He owns companies. He owns an NFL team. It's beautiful to watch. Partial owner. Yeah, partial owner. But still, like, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Especially reading his book about where he comes from, the things he's been through and stuff he's did, and to see where he's at now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think I knew that he um, wrote a book, so I'm definitely going to have to check out Decoded. And Jay-Z is a good example of someone who did not let people keep him in a box. He moved way beyond just being a rapper. Artist. Just, mm-hmm. Yeah, you just listed, you know, a lot of his accomplishments right there. So I'm definitely going to have to check out that book. And this book hasn't been recommended yet on the podcast, so definitely have to check it out. So last question before I let you guys go. When describing the meaning of living your truth, I want you to complete this phrase, okay? I'm gonna give you three, two words and you tell me what your third word is, okay? Self-awareness, purpose, and... Wait, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the first one because my father... Self-awareness. Oh, self-awareness. Self-awareness, purpose. purpose. And... You want to make up his own word? Self-esteem. Self-esteem is important. I love that. I love that. It, it goes because when you have self-awareness and you know what your purpose is, you have a better self-esteem. Your self-esteem mm-hmm. is a lot higher. That's one thing like I feel like people look over 
a little bit. Like that's something that we really need in our lives. When you don't have self-esteem, anyone and everyone can influence you. Anyone could tell you anything and it could affect you and it could hurt you. When your self-esteem is high, you just, no one could touch you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And just like you said earlier, you don't spend your time trying to force people to see you as who you are right now. That takes, mm-hmm. That's right there as an example of how high your self-esteem is because how many people fall into that trap when somebody says something negative to them on, on social media? People fall into that trap all the time. But you guys have been amazing. Thank you so much. No, thank you. You know, even as we doing this, like he gets so much requests and all of this stuff. It's like this just like because this is what we need to be doing in here, like these Zooms and just talks and stuff like that. I told him he should start like a sports podcast, but thank you. Thank you for having us. I wish you much success. Uh, you have a very ex- ex- like cool piece, exclusive piece. So, you know, we'll help you uh, try to get it out there as well. We thank you and we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being so open in the conversation today. I really appreciate that. Okay, so let me tell you why I feel so honored in this moment right now. Like after the show, Dash told me that this conversation was the first time that he has been on camera or has been interviewed during his son's career. Now you heard how young Naeem was when he started, right? So naturally... People wanted to meet his dad, but Dash will always decline the invitation to speak, you know, because he didn't want to steal his son's shine. You know, how cool is that, right? And, you know, doing my research on the two, um, I found a video of Naeem on Good Morning, Good Morning America where he was being interviewed by Robin Roberts. And Robin asked Dash to come out and he said no. So knowing this is his first interview, you know, together with his son, you know, on my podcast platform has me feeling really, really honored right now. So not only did Dash join the conversation, but he shared a lot about his healing journey and how his healing journey has impacted his son. And then you got to hear how Naeem was able to find strength and encouragement in his father's healing journey. And, you know, I think... Some parents, and you know, if you're a parent, maybe you can, maybe you can relate. I think that some parents tend to hide their hurt and hide their shame from their child in order to maintain their child's respect. And I think in this case, we don't give our children, you know, the benefit of the doubt. I think healing from hurt and shame should be exemplified in the home. As a way to teach your child how to be authentic in a world that doesn't accept their authenticity. You know, showing your child how to heal would teach them how to embrace their uniqueness for operating in purpose to avoid the traps that society can put out there for them. So, something to think about. Something to really meditate on. To take into consideration and to have a conversation with, you know, your children, like Naeem so eloquently stated and advised us to do during our conversation. Now, after having this wonderful conversation and commentary about parenting, (laughs) you're probably thinking, Keisha, I'd love to raise a child like Naeem, but the way my dating life is set up... No worries. I got you covered. Just come back next week so we can talk about it. Family, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my podcast every single week. If you need help making the connection between supporting your family and operating in purpose, then head on over to strategizeyourvision.com for more information. Also note that all audible recommendations given on any episode are linked in the show notes, and you can try Audible for free. Please remember to leave a five-star rating and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And also, don't forget, click the join community link that's in the show notes so we can stay connected. Family, as you know, I set a lofty goal to touch one million hearts within the first two years of the podcast, and I can only do it with your help. So please remember to download each episode, share the conversation with at least four people you know, and repost on your favorite social media platform. Well, family, I appreciate you. 
Has anybody told you that today? Has anybody told you how much they appreciate you today? Well, I do. And my heart is filled with so much gratitude. So until next time, always remember that you are enough and your truth is beautiful.